Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ, for there is no other. Thankful for the opportunity that you've given us, that you continue to give us to just study your word together. I ask that you would just filter out all of the nonsense, all of the foolishness, but seal to our hearts only truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, and we're continuing on in our study in the epistle of Jude. Scripture is God-breathed. We're not looking at the thoughts, the ideas, the inventions, the uh, or anything else of the human author. And I'm not trying to take away from from their own personal experience or what God, how God worked in their life. But Scripture is God breathed. I'm not concerned about where Jude got his ideas. And the reason for that is it's because it, it is the Holy Spirit that is leading Jude to write this epistle. The author of this book is God Almighty, the same God who redeemed us, who made us new creations in Christ. We looked at verse 5, and I suggested that we were looking at a mixed multitude, some of which were overthrown in the wilderness due to their unbelief. where none but Joshua and Caleb actually entered into uh, his rest, which I believe is the most stark picture of the result of non-belief in a believer's life. These were God's people. And as I pointed out, the believers do not always believe. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking about uh, the gospel. But in fact... I, I will go as far as to suggest that there are many who have been redeemed, who have been bought and purchased by the blood of Christ. They are the elect, the chosen of God, yet they do not, may not yet know it. And uh, they're not, uh, in many cases, they're not absolutely, uh, I would say, in line with the truth concerning the gospel. So, in a sense, they're, they're believers, but they're not believing. But when we carry it beyond the matter of justification into sanctification, uh, it, is, it is quite often in the believer's life that uh, the believer uh, fails to trust God. We all do. Uh, at many times, we are unfaithful. So, a believer uh, can sometimes not believe. And we looked at verse 6, which did not seem to me like that these were angels that followed Satan in his uprising. I, d I doubt that because these angels uh, are... Well, the reason I doubt that is because these angels are said to be in everlasting chains and they're not free to operate as demons. I believe that we saw in the seventh verse that the ones in Sodom and Gomorrah went after strange flesh or different flesh, in which case it looks like the angels of verse 6 did the same thing. And I suggested to you that the, the antecedent in verse 7 appears to be the angels in verse 6. And I personally think that what the Jewish commentators say about this in, in Genesis chapter 6 makes sense. That seems the most sensible to me. I have to leave it to the Holy Spirit to filter out all, all, filter out the junk that comes out of my mouth, so that at least some particle of truth is sealed to your heart. So we're going to begin verse eight here in this, uh, in this part four of this series of studies. Now bear in mind, this is the Holy Spirit talking, not Jude. We don't have to puzzle over where Jude got these strange ideas. Likewise, the text says, and there's that word again, in the same way, in like manner, and the antecedent appears to be what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. These 
filthy dreamers defile the flesh. And uh, I'm not suggesting that none of this is sexual or uh, that we're not looking at things erotic here. I don't suggest that at all, but I think that it, it includes both a spiritual immorality as well as a physical immorality. Folks, it's not hard to understand that God does use real life uh, examples of sexual immorality to teach a deeper, more profound lesson of spiritual immorality, spiritual fornication, spiritual adultery. Where that I pointed out, it's 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 having a, a an affair with the law when you're not related to the law, you're not married to the law, you're married to Christ, you're a spouse to Christ, and so uh, being that you're a, a spouse to Christ, you're having a uh, an affair with the law, an endless flirtatious affair with the law. The law is your is where you're uh, you're preoccupied with the law not Christ, not the one who fulfilled the law. We have Christ, the fulfillment of the law, living inside us. He's the one that we have a relationship with, not the law. I don't know how to say it really any, any plainer than that. Now, I personally believe, and, and, and once again, I don't ask anyone to agree with me on anything, but I personally believe that physical immorality always follows spiritual immorality. I don't believe it works the other way around. Spiritual immorality is what breeds physical immorality. Likewise, these dreamers, the King James has filthy dreamers, Actually, the Greek word itself for, for dreamers there can be translated filthy dreamers. They defile the flesh. Now, they, there are several ways you can defile the flesh, and one of those is sexual immorality. So with many people who teach Jew, that's the only, that's the only place that, that they concentrate. You know, that it's all about human sexuality. But, folks, I think it's more than that. I think that you can defile the flesh by suggesting that the flesh is able to redeem itself by works of the law. We're told later on in verse 23, that close to the end of the, of the epistle here, that some can have a garment spotted by the flesh. The, the word is, is having been stained. The, the word denotes the, the undergarment, that which is worn next to the skin. And as we know, we know that if, if we've done any studying at all, we know that we have all been clothed with Christ. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. You didn't baptize yourself into Christ. Therefore, you didn't clothe yourself with Christ clothed with power from on high. We see that in Acts. Accepted in the Beloved, having put on Christ. All of this having to do with what? With the righteousness which comes to us on the basis of faith, which I've suggested is the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, where that we became the righteousness of God in Him. By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. One of the ways to defile the flesh, of course, is to involve yourself in physical, sexual immorality. And I've been told that, you know, well, I ought to preach on those kinds of things. My only job, folks, is to tell you what this text shows to the best of my ability. Another way that you can defile the flesh is to teach flesh. To teach that the flesh is able to redeem itself by keeping rules and regulations. And, and what I'm suggesting to you folks is that if I taught that, I believe the result of that, if I, if I taught the flesh, if I preached to the flesh, 
to, that you needed to clean up the old man. If, if I preached a message of self to self, I believe the result of that would lead to every kind of sinful manifestation of the flesh. Why? Because the strength of sin is the law. Hopefully you're following my train of thought here on this. Now if you have a different train of thought, the Holy Spirit will reveal that to you as well. But this is how I'm looking at the text. And I don't believe that I'm prejudicing uh, the text by you know, my formerly held beliefs. I don't, th I don't think I'm taking my, my own uh, beliefs here uh, into the text and in, in forming an interpretation based upon my own preconceived ideas. I don't believe I'm doing that. The reason why I don't believe I'm doing that is, is that I would, I would much rather believe that what I am doing is I am cross-referencing and I'm seeing how that that uh, you know, flesh and law, and, and we're looking at a lot of strange flesh here in, in this epistle. We're looking at, at the uh, a phrase used by the Holy Spirit, strange flesh. Even though it's only mentioned once, the, the, the actual uh, substance of that phrase is, is seen throughout many verses and in many places. We know that we walk according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh. I hope you understand what I'm trying to, to drive home here, the point that I'm trying to make. So one of the ways to defile the flesh is to teach how good it is, where, where that you, and this is the str really strange part about this, you know, because this is what modern Christianity does. You know, it teaches that you're really, uh, really not totally depraved. The old man, there is no such thing as an old man. You're just a single-natured individual. You're not a dual-natured individual. How to get around that, I don't know. You, you don't really have an old man and a new man, and that we, which are distinctly separate from one another. Or that the old man is unchangeable. It'll, it'll always sin. It, it can never... Uh, from, you know, there's nothing good dwells in the flesh. The flesh profits nothing. And then you have the new man, the sinless new man, which cannot sin. Why? Because his seed abides in us and we cannot sin. So it's really odd to me that, that you know, in modern Christianity or modern, uh, basically most pulpit teaching, you know, uh, preaches to the flesh because they preach law. So one of the ways to defile the flesh is to teach how good it is where that you strangely wind up later having to make a confession concerning how bad it is. You know, I got really got to scratch my head over that one. So these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. The word dreamers there, the word means to dream while asleep well, that seems to make sense. But figuratively, a daydream in which the believer meditates, contemplates. Uh, Jude uses the word in connection with the wrong kind of dreaming. This, this hoping, this desiring. It, it resists, it opposes God's authority, yet it, it expects... Uh, you know, it's personal aspirations to be met. The uh, ideas, the inventions of his own daydreams, it, ex it expects God to grant those. This, this, wor this word, folks, it describes a person that is completely out of touch with the principles of sound doctrine and just basically makes things up. This is just what I think. This is what I dream. Daydreamer. Dreaming while awake. So essentially defiling the flesh is to teach that the flesh can better itself by doing righteousness. The flesh can become righteous. I'm going to tell you that your flesh is not 
you know, totally depraved. I'm going to tell you how good it is. And if you really work hard at it, I mean, really, really work hard at it, you know, and, and be like most of your other Christian friends that seem to be making it because you're not, you know, then you can go to heaven. And I've defiled the flesh. These people, they despise dominions. And they speak evil of dignities. And I, I do not think that's describing Trump haters. Or, or to be fair, you know, Biden haters. Or, you know, fill in the blanks. God does set up over the nations whomever He will. Most of us know that. But I seriously doubt that the Holy Spirit has politicians in mind here. These filthy dreamers who defile the flesh, who say, if you really work at it, you can go to heaven. Or I know we're under grace, but we still got to keep the law. Or you got to clean up the flesh. These, these particular individuals, they say that dominions and areas of authority that God has established are invalid. So they're in, in effect, they're, what they're saying is that they're saying that those whom God has placed in authority over them are evil. That's what they're saying. That's what the text is telling us. These are individuals who are, who are on their own. There's no authority over them. People who declare invalid areas of authority and they have no respect for those who are over them in those areas of authority. Yet Michael, Michael, the archangel, now some suggest this is Christ. I don't believe it's Christ. I believe it's, uh, I guess, and, I, and I, I do believe that you could make a good, you might make a good argument for it being Christ. I personally don't believe it's Christ. I believe it's Michael the archangel, although there is some biblical, ar ar biblical uh, argument uh, that the term is used of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think Michael is the one who stands for his people. Michael the archangel, when he contended with the devil in disputing about the body of Moses, could not bring against him a railing accusation, all he could say was, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. The scriptures clearly declare that the Lord took Moses out in the wilderness and Moses died and the Lord buried him. Now, why would Satan want the body of Moses? It is a thrill to me that the Lord buried Moses. The text is clear. The Lord buried him. The Lord buried Moses because Christ fulfilled the law. Because the Jews were after the law of Moses and God got through with it once and for all. The law was added until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And the word until means it can be added. And I recognize that the scriptures mean what they say. They mean the Lord took Moses out in the wilderness and the Lord buried him. That's fact. Okay? But one of the wonderful applications of that is that the Lord was through with the law. In fact, the law was never given to the church at all. And to my knowledge, no treasure hunter, no archaeological society or tourist bureau has found the body of Moses. Why? Because God did not intend Moses be found. They can't bring the law up again. Of course, they tried to do it all the time. It seems to me that's why Satan wanted the body of Moses. I mean, suppose you found it. I mean, if one of our presidents is going to lay in, 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 in state for a week at one of, one of his funerals, 
Can you imagine what Israel would have done with the body of Moses? They'd have mummified it. They'd have, you know, encased it in glass, you know, sold tickets to see it. And it would have been their God until Jesus returned. Satan knew that. Satan knew one of the wonderful things that he could do to corrupt God's people would have been to possess the body of Moses. A dead man. I've, I've attended funerals where people would come up to me and, and they'd say, well, don't he look natural? Ne no, never did to me. Never been to a funeral yet where anybody looked natural. They looked dead to me. I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to offend anyone here. Um, I don't mean to, to sound insensitive. I'm just trying to make a point. Now, we know that the law is not dead, but we've clearly, we know we've died to the law. We've died to the law in order that we might bear fruit unto God. I'm not going to bring an accusation against someone who has defiled the flesh. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're teaching law, I'm not going to, you know, bring an accusation against you and say, you know, well, you know, you're the devil for doing so. As if I was Michael saying that you're the devil, you know, Michael the archangel could have said, you know, but, but you're the devil. He didn't do that. All he said was the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. How do we do that? How do we rebuke? By means of the truth of the Word of God. It's the only way. We don't have a rebuke of our own, made up of our own words. Anyhow, we know from Deuteronomy 34, verse 6, that it was the Lord who buried Moses. We know that Michael the archangel contended with Satan over his body. We know that the Lord buried his body, that the Lord in intended that Moses not be found. His body not be found. Now, what Michael and the devil did, you know, fight, talk, debate, you know, I have no idea. I don't know if the devil knew where the body was or if it, I don't know if Israel went out looking for uh, Moses' body or if Josh, uh, Joshua said, you know, you're wasting your time looking. But I have no doubt at, at all as to why the devil wanted the body. He wanted, he wanted it, the body of Moses to resurrect the law and that has always been Satan's argument. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Galatians 4, 29 and 30. These people are speaking evil of things which they don't know. These people are speaking evil about something they know nothing about. You go on some of these apostate websites and the things that they say about grace are evil. You know, it's so easy to speak evil as something that you don't know anything about. If they knew God, it'd be a tremendously different situation. They speak evil of those things which they do not know. And the word know there in the text is oida. And it's, it's in the perfect tense. I have to conclude from that that they never knew it. There is that segment of Christianity that believes that, that one who is God's can, can, can apostatize to the extent that they go to hell, even though they were redeemed, which is a, really a foolish argument, a foolish, foolish argument. It is the finished work of Jesus Christ. Since you go to heaven based on something that you didn't do, how can you undo something you didn't do? 
On the other hand, if you think you go to heaven because of something you did, well, it's no giant leap to say that you can undo what you did. The truth is that we are God's children because we are born from above by God, by the will of God, not by the will of the flesh, John 1.13. The perfect tense of the words not know or know not in, the, in, the, in our text here indicates that they never were God's people. They weren't God's people and, and then they, at one point, and then they lost that position and now all of a sudden they're not God's people. They, they were never God's people. They simply don't know it. I'm going to suggest that there's a clear connection with verse 4 where we're told they were ordained to this condemnation before. And when we went through the fourth verse, I tried to point out to you, you know, not to miss the fact that God ordained that these people creep in unawares. And it's a shame that it's unawares. I don't think that the text really allows us to really even say that we ought to that we ought to know enough biblical doctrine where we don't allow that to happen. Folks, it's gonna happen. Now from a human standpoint, yeah, I I would I, I'm more than willing to suggest that you know it's even though that they were ordained to come in, to creep in unaware, it is a sad fact that they weren't recognized, and I believe that they can be, but only through an understanding of the truth, if you follow what I'm saying here. God ordained it to happen. It's going to happen. If it didn't, well, then there, there would be that terrible temptation to talk about how wonderful, you know, uh, Blessed Hope, you know, Forever Channel is, you know, as if this is the only online church that teaches truth. You know, it's the only channel where everybody loves one another from a pure heart fervently. It, it's the only Facebook where there's no criticism. It's, it's the only channel on YouTube in the world that teaches the truth. Until you look around and realize that's not the truth. You're not going to find a perfect pastor. What you are going to find is a, a perfect Jesus Christ. Perfection is Jesus Christ. Now, I may be pushing the perfect tense here. That's up to you to, to decide. But I believe that there's a connection with the fact that God ordained that they never knew the truth. But what they do know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. What they do know naturally as brute beasts in those things they corrupt themselves. And I am not able to tell you how important that verse is. There's a, the reason why I think it's so important is because there's a tremendous push of natural theology. What we see in, in human nature and what we know from experience is considered to be truth. People that have faith in something like the scriptures, I mean, I mean, who in the world can believe that? But but we can believe experiences. We can believe in self. We can believe in human nature. And in these things, they know naturally they corrupt themselves. One of the things that we know naturally is to trust in ourselves. And we know that the natural man cannot discern the things of the Spirit. Even the so-called atheist, which I don't believe there really is such a thing, but they trust a God called chance or, 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 or time. But here we're talking about those who crept in unaware. They don't know any more than the unregenerate man knows because that's what they are, unregenerate. Read Isaiah and 
and you get the idea from the Holy Spirit that the animals actually pay more attention to God. I just want to read a few verses here from Ezekiel 34 before I close. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Ye eat the fat, and ye clothe you with the wool. Ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. The diseased have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost. But with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them, and they were scattered, because there is no shepherd, and they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. Therefore, ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely, because my flock became a prey, and my flock became meat to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may not be meat for them. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out, as a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered. So will I seek out my sheep, and will deliver them out of all places where they've been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. I love you all. I truly do. I appreciate everyone who is messaging me, uh, encouraging me, praying for me. Uh, we appreciate your support. Please help support this ministry if you can. I'll be... Uh, Reluctantly, I'm, I've decided to go ahead and, and, and start printing some, some small paperbacks to help people share with others to help uh, to get the word out. And so uh, help spread the word of the gospel, help bring his people out of bondage, the terrible, terrible bondage of the law into that, uh, that wonderful place of rest in the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.